Hi folks. In this video, I'd like to outline some main points of the article, Needs, Moral Self-Consciousness, and Professional Roles by Andrew Alexander and Seamus Miller. The main thesis of this paper is that professional roles can be defined in terms of the fundamental needs they provide. The authors explain how the activities of professionals are different than those of other occupations. They approach professional roles in terms of characteristic features of paradigmatic professions, such as law, medicine, and architecture. To begin with, professionals have certain educational requirements and are usually members of an institution that oversees those requirements. They often oversee ethical behavior of the professionals in the institution. One important point the authors make is that the professions usually exercise a legal monopoly over the kinds of services offered in their areas of expertise. For example, only qualified lawyers can represent someone in court for payment and only qualified medical practitioners can treat people in hospitals. So generally speaking, professionals tend to be sheltered from vigorous competition within the professional area. Professionals receive benefits and a distinctive status as members of the profession, but in some respects, professionals are also restricted relative to other workers. For instance, professionals are generally not able to participate in all the potential benefits of the market. There are a number of ways, a uh, number of other ways that professionals are not allowed to benefit from their experience, and the consequences for using uh, their skills for illegal ends may be more severe than those of non-professionals. So, according to the authors, there are differences between what professionals are supposed to do and what other occupations are supposed to do. These differences lead to the question, is there one major feature that will tell us the difference between a profession and a non-profession? It is the author's contention that we can. The goods which professionals provide are the satisfaction of fundamental needs. The authors further distinguish these needs from mere desires. If I need X and Y is necessary for me to obtain X, then I need Y also. But if I only desire X and Y is necessary for my obtaining X, then it doesn't follow that I desire Y also. Similarly, my reason to obtain X can be called a first order reason to act to obtain the need. A second order reason is a reason to act uh, or not on the first order reason. A fundamental need always provides both a first and second order reason to act to obtain a fundamental need. So, uh, for the example, if I am sick, my first order reason to uh, act is to get well. My second order reason is to do what I have to do to get well, like go to the doctor. On the other hand, if I want a new car, my first order reason is to get the car that I want, but if I have to go without food in order to save for the car, the second order reason to save money would be to get the car, which may not be a good enough reason to do it. In short, a fundamental need is something that justifies doing pretty much whatever you have to do to get it. Alexander and Miller's point here is that a fundamental need is something that is provided by a professional. It is rational that we obtain our fundamental needs. Not only that, it is also moral to obtain our fundamental needs. It is rational for me to fulfill fundamental needs. It is also moral for someone else to satisfy it. So my need in such circumstances is the basis for a claim right against those who can satisfy it. A claim right is a right which entails responsibilities, duties, and obligations on other parties regarding the right holder. If I have a fundamental need I can't satisfy myself, I have a right to expect that need from someone who could satisfy it. The person who can satisfy it then has a duty to provide it. Along with these two features of a fundamental need, the authors offer a third, the transitivity of reasons. If in order to fulfill my fundamental need, it is necessary that I do X, then I have a reason to both fulfill my need and to fulfill X. For a mere desire, I may have a reason to obtain the object of my desire, but not a reason to do what is necessary to obtain the object of my desire. 
In the words of the authors, the chain of reasons extends as far as the chain of necessary conditions. So just as I always have a good reason to fulfill a fundamental need, I also have good reasons to fulfill whatever actions I need to take to fulfill that need. A couple of more points. The relation between professionals and their client group is not the same as the relationship between buyers and sellers in the market or in a market. A transaction in the market is only rational when the actors or parties believe that their desires will be more satisfied after the transaction. But professionals are not simply market actors because they have an obligation to provide certain kinds of goods to those in need. It's not a question who will be satisfied at the end of a transaction, like it is for market actors. The professional is obliged to do what is necessary to satisfy the client's needs, so they're not free to enter into agreements which could prevent them from acting to satisfy those needs. In addition, since the fulfillment of fundamental needs requires doing whatever is necessary to fulfill them, the authors argue that professionals must establish and maintain professional communities. These communities are necessary for the fulfillment of fundamental needs. In a similar vein, the achievement and retention of health is the purpose of the health professions. And reaching this is dependent in part on the provision of adequate public health facilities, such as clean water and effective sewage service. As a result, as part of their professional role, doctors should be prepared to agitate for such services. And similarly, other professionals must be prepared to agitate for services that would bring about their better being able to satisfy clients' needs. This article has argued that the ends uh, uh, that define a professional activity are the satisfaction of fundamental needs, and the demand for such satisfaction is a moral demand. But is this an adequate definition? Does this definition really comport with our intuitions and pre-philosophical judgments about what counts as a profession? These are both questions that you should always be asking yourself, by the way, when you read these articles. I here offer a possible counter argument to this point. Take, for instance, the author's example of eating as a fundamental need. Does that mean that cooking is a profession? I mean, it might make sense to say that a chef who is educated in a culinary institute is a professional, but does that extend to the person who makes burgers at McDonald's? Perhaps not. Another possible example might be this. We tend to think of higher education teachers as more of a profession than K-12 teachers, but the latter seems more fundamental than the former. These are just some questions that occurred to me while I was reading the article. Maybe there are easy responses to them and maybe not. Food for thought in any case. See if you can find uh, some counter arguments of your own. I hope this video has helped with your understanding of this article. Thank you for your time and attention.